And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Alison Killing. I've only just met Alison, but I have followed her work for some time and discovered her through a project she was involved with called Death in Venice. Alison is an architect, trained in the UK, and now runs a really innovative practice in Rotterdam. She's not only interested in the quality and the history of the healing environment, but she's interested in many other projects that interface with our world, such as the response to constructing cities again after humanitarian disasters, a really interesting project that Alison's now doing on mapping refugee migration. And I'm sure Alison will explain to us how that all connects with what we're going to hear about this afternoon. But the concept of environment is so important, and we know that the environment is made up of people, and we focus a lot on that, and that is the, um, maybe the key theme of this conference. But the built environment we know in hospice care is really important. So, without further ado, Alison is going to talk to us. Can we all welcome her? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name's Alison Killing. As was already said, I'm an architect and urban designer. And following on from what you've just heard, it's maybe helpful if I give you a little bit of background into my practice. So as she said, I, I trained in the UK and then I moved to the Netherlands eight, nine years ago. I've worked in commercial architecture practice, designing buildings, uh, doing city master plans, designing strategies for neighborhoods. But when I started working for myself about six years ago, I set up a practice called Killing Architects. And, <laughs> um, and a lot of my work since then has been not only designing buildings and continuing to develop urban strategies, but it's been based in research, in writing, in filmmaking, in doing exhibitions, and a lot of it has been about looking at the way our built environment works, how social and political and economic factors interface that, and explaining that to, to the communities who, who live in those places and helping them to think about how they themselves can get involved in shaping that environment. Um, my work is project-based, so that sort of helps to explain what might otherwise appear to be a slightly scattershot uh, collection of projects so that, yes, I, I have a, I did an exhibition about death a couple of years ago, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more now, but I'm also uh, involved in mapping the refugee crisis, been looking at temporary uses for empty buildings and neighbourhoods, uh, and making films about the reconstruction after the earthquake in Haiti. But um, yeah, for now, I'd like to talk a little bit about death in Venice and to talk a little bit about how I got into doing this project. So in Venice, Venice has a Biennale, as I'm sure most of you have heard. And every two years in the summer, they do an art Biennale. And then alter on alternate years, they do an architecture Biennale. So 2014 was architecture year. And the director, Rem Kolhas, set as the theme of the Biennale, fundamentals. And he asked all of the national pavilions in Venice there's a national pavilion for the UK, for France, for America, for the Democratic Republic of Congo, for Thailand. A lot of nations have one. He asked all of the national pavilions to look at modernism in their own country between 1914 and 2014. And so the British Council, who runs the British Pavilion, they held an open call for, to find an actual exhibition to produce and to find the team that would produce that exhibition. And two days before the deadline, a friend of mine, Stephen, phoned me up and said, hey, Alison, I've got an idea. Let's do an exhibition about death. And I was like, okay, fine. So I pulled a couple more friends together so that we had the expertise that we needed for that team. And we sat down for two days and we made that proposal. And we didn't get selected for the British Pavilion. But at the end of that process, we had an idea that we really liked and we had a proposal that was well-developed enough that I could go out and start to fundraise around it. And we did get funding, and we did get to produce Death in Venice in June 2014 in Venice. 
It's a very literal title. It's about death. It's in Venice. It actually focused on the situation in London and in the UK more widely. And this is some of the exhibition. So I don't know if any of you have ever been to Venice at Biennale time. There's a huge number of exhibitions on then. And it's, it's kind of overwhelming. You'll see like 50 exhibitions in one day. And so for that reason, and also because of the subject matter, we wanted to produce something that was quite light and that was quite playful, that people could, um, yeah, that, that you didn't need to immediately feel the weight and the seriousness of the topics, that, that people could start to engage with it gently and on their own terms and gradually get into the, the weight of the subject matter. So the first installation that we made was a giant map, which was of London, and it showed all of the spaces in the city that were related to death and dying, and they were lit up white on the map. They, those are the white blocks that you can see. And they were the hospitals and hospices and cemeteries and crematoria and morgues around the city, far more than I think most people realize, and far more than we realized when we set out to do this research. And then, it's interactive, and as you wave your hand across the map, different information appears about those spaces. This was quite a fun, quite light, um, very playful thing. And then this was, this was the final room of the exhibition. And in this, we were really looking at what are the social changes that have taken place over the past 100 years? And then what, how have spaces related to death and dying changed with that? So the four tables that you can see in, front of, in the front of the picture, they showed the changing series of spaces that we pass through on either side of death. On the table on, on the right, that's 1914, and then we have 1948, 1981, and 2014. So it's a split of 33 years across that century. And in the 1914 table, what you can see is that Actually, it's, it's a relatively simple process. There isn't a huge amount of variation in where people die. People tend to have the same sort of funeral um, service. They, they all, um, they'll typically be, have that funeral at the local church, be buried in the local graveyard, and there's not a huge amount of variation in where they go at the end of it, because at that point, cremation wasn't really acceptable. And as you move forward through the years, the process gradually gets more complicated until you get to 2014, where you have much, much greater variety. People suddenly are dying. Some, some people do still die at home, but a lot die in hospital, in hospices, in care homes, in nursing homes. And then they pass through a greater number of spaces on the way to finally having a much greater variety of funerary rites and finally to get either cremated, potentially buried, to have a green burial. This was a huge change over the course of that century. This is a close-up of some of the postcards. This is actually from 1981. And you could take these postcards away with you so that you could produce your own sort of catalog of the exhibition. And then these are the infographics which showed the changing social trends over that time. Everything from the age at which people die, sort of lowering in child mortality, to a massive change in what people actually die of over that period, and an increase in cremation. Those were particularly notable examples. So to come back to my friend Stephen, who had this original idea. Stephen, he's, he's an architect. He studied architecture at university along with another friend, George. And they had been looking at the architecture of intensive care units and hospitals. They'd been looking at crematoria. And they'd been looking at the way that public space is used as a space of mourning in the case of a public death. In, in, the, in George's case, it was Princess Diana's death. And during the course of their research, Stephen had kind of been struck, almost became obsessed with the idea of the Liverpool care pathway. And the idea that... Um, well, the idea that when somebody is dead could suddenly become a bureaucratic decision, that bureaucracy had intruded so heavily into this process of what was actually an organic and very human process. 
And he was interested in what this said about the current state of our society, about its attitude to technology, to science, to bureaucracy, and hidden in there, what it said about our attitude to mortality. Now, death is understudied within architecture. Although, actually, it may be fairer to say that architecture has a greater regard for death than it does for dying. So within architectural history, you'll find quite a lot of mausolea. You'll find studies of, of, um, of cemeteries and designs for cemeteries. But there's very little interest in the actual places that we die. Instead, the focus is on, is on memorial and occasionally on ritual around death. I think that the reason for that neglect is that death was often seen until relatively recently as a domestic matter. And once death started to become institutionalized over the course of the 20th century, it became subsumed within greater narratives. So the narrative of the 20th century, at least as it applies to architecture, is one of light and greenery and health and air. And this was a reaction to the slums of the Victorian era, to the disease and the overcrowding of those cities. And modern architecture was a necessary corrective to that. It saw that with technology and science and progress, you could bring health to the masses and that houses could become machines for living. Now, Many of the changes that we looked at, they happened just outside of living memory. So they happened 100 to maybe 120 years ago. And when we first came to start doing this research, we brought with us this assumption that our modern, many of our modern institutions have always existed. And if not quite in their current form, then one that was immediately recognizable. So we were really surprised to learn, for example, that the modern hospital was only around 100 years old and that cremation in the West and crematoria were of a similar age, and even more shocked to learn that the modern hospice had only appeared around 50 years ago. That seemed incredibly young to us. And what was also striking in that was that these institutions were new, but also there was no clear idea of what these buildings should be like. What how, she, how they should be conceived of, and what an architectural response to these needs should be. And this was a problem that was actually very common to architects in the 19th and the early 20th centuries, that societal changes had produced demand for, for buildings that had actually never been seen before. And actually, railways are a very good example. They were developed over the course of the 19th century. And suddenly we had this need for these very large civic buildings. There was a lot of confusion and a lot of discussion and thought about exactly what they should be and what they should be like. What should be, what was an appropriate reference for a building of this size? A factory, I mean, they were big enough, but they also seemed a little bit too prosaic. But then should it be a cathedral? You know, they were big enough. And then what about the new technology that it brought? that came with this, that the glass and the large, the large amounts of steel that you were able to build with. This, this, this gave a huge challenge to designers. And some, you know, many of the buildings that resulted were derided as being quite ugly. Um, but we also need to recognize the scale of the challenge that these designers were grappling with. We had similar problems when it came to death. So this is the first crematoria, the first crematorium in the UK, which is in Woking in Surrey. And it was built in the 1870s. And as you can see, it's quite, um, it's quite industrial looking. It's really all about, it's about the furnace to dispose of the body. And it's about the chimney for getting rid of the smoke that comes with that. And this was quite shocking at the time, as I still find it quite shocking now. Because, you know, aesthetically at least, this is just not how we want to see the funeral rites for our loved ones. This just isn't seen as being appropriate. So it was very industrial. Cremation also brought up new ideas about what rituals we should have around death. Burial was quite well understood in the West, um, that you'd have a service, the coffin is then brought to 
to a ready dug grave. It's lowered into, into the grave, and then people will throw handfuls of earth as a few words are said. It's well understood, and this goes back a very long way in our societies. But cremation didn't have the same rituals, and it didn't seem fully able to, to draw on those of burial. Modern architecture has really struggled with ritual. And similarly, I think, similarly, so has secular society. Modern architecture hasn't come across this problem on its own. It's, it builds on the opportunities and, and difficulties of society. So that as secular, secularism has struggled with this, it's not surprising that modern architecture has too. And the way that this was actually dealt with was by building a chapel onto, onto the side of this building. It sh disguised the chimney, and then it also provided a space for the ritual that we expect to happen around death. Hospitals also had reasonably had some similar issues that the modern hospital hadn't really been seen before. And their design was driven to a very large extent by the practical demands of the buildings, of the science and the technology and the machines that needed to be housed in them. So modern hospitals came about because with the invention of large machinery such as x-ray machines, suddenly you needed a large building to house them in. No one doctor Previously, doctors had always visited patients in their home, assuming they were rich enough. But suddenly, no one doctor could afford to have an x-ray machine, and they were much too bulky to carry around. So we needed hospitals to put them in. And those buildings came to be des designed around those demands. Similarly, these were quite large institutions, and so you needed very large buildings. Now, the these buildings for hospitals, they weren't completely driven by the demands of technology and bureaucracy. There was some real effort right from the beginning, right from the beginning to look at a more human-centric design. So this is a sanatorium in Paimio by Alva Alto, and it's in Finland. Sanatoria were designed for the treatment of TB. And early on, it was often, it was often thought that TB was carried by bad air. And so that the treatment for this would be a lot of daylight, which is great, and also a lot of ventilation. So you got these very large, very airy, very bright buildings. But what Alto's insight was, was that for a patient lying down in the bed, even with these light, airy buildings, the windowsills were too high to be seen out of. And so what he did in this building, famously, was to lower all of the windowsills and to give an almost completely glazed facade so that as somebody was lying in bed, they would still be able to look out of the window. A hospital design has, has changed quite substantially over the past 100 years, and it's much more patient-centric and is much more inclined to put the patient's experience at the heart of the process. But still, these buildings have to, have to deal with some quite onerous demands still. And I don't want to give you the impression that, um, that it's easy to design around those demands. A hospital still has to deal with a huge amount of machinery for x-ray machines, for MRI scanners, for operating theatres. And with that comes a demand for a lot of cooling, potentially for heating, for electricity, and for ventilation as well. And what that means is a lot of cables and a lot of ducts. Now, the best way to get cables and ducts around a building, especially a large one, is often in the ceiling. And that's what typically happens in, in hospitals, that the, pla that the ducts and cables will be run through this, the, um, they'll be run through the ceiling and the corridor from which the rooms on either side can be serviced. And that's why you often get very low ceilings in the corridors and this quite oppressive feel. They're also very, um, they're still very large buildings, very large institutions. That means that you need a lot of corridors to connect them. The other thing is that you tend to prioritize giving the daylight to the wards or to the offices. And so you leave the corridors to be lit by fluorescent light. The last thing is that I noticed when I worked on hospital design, which was actually my first job after graduation. Nursing ratios are also a huge driver in the way that hospitals are laid out. So that while a lot of patients might like to have their own individual room, that's not efficient for staffing. It's much easier to have 
three bed wards where a nurse can stick their head around the door and check that three patients are still doing okay than it is for that person to have to go individually around three rooms. And so the cost of running and staffing a hospital is also a, main driver, is also a major driver of design. So in many ways, hospitals are still quite unsatisfactory as places for dying. When we were doing our research, we were quite shocked to learn that almost 60% of people currently die in hospitals in the UK, many of them on public wards, and that, in fact, 50% of the complaints in the NHS relate to the care of someone who's dying. As we were studying and researching, we also came across a piece of research by British Social Attitudes, which was carried out in 2012. And that asked people to reflect on their level of comfort in talking about death, particularly their own death or those of their loved ones. It asked them whether they'd ever spoken to anyone about this topic. And it asked people very relevantly to us, where did they want to die and why? And then they compared that with what actually happened. So about 67% of people said that they wanted to die at home. 7% of people said that they wanted to die in hospital. And then a small percentage, 4%, said that they wanted to die in a hospice. You can note the contrast with where people actually die, with the 60% who actually end up dying in hospital. What was perhaps more revealing for us, though, was the reasons that people gave for their preferences. So those who wanted to die at home said so because they wanted to be around friends and family at the time of death. Where people wanted to die in hospital, their priority was to be pain-free. And for those who planned, for those who hoped to die in a hospice, their priority was to die di with dignity, although to be pain-free also came in as quite a close second. Wanting to die at home, though, was something that we saw and heard again and again in the research that we did. And what was interesting in, in this survey was a follow-up question which asked people as the people who wanted to die at home, if you didn't have access to the medical and nursing support that you might need to have the end of life experience that you might ideally like to have, if that wasn't available, would you still want to die at home? And at that point, 60% of people changed their minds and said that they would prefer to die somewhere else. But there were still 30% of people who didn't, who still insisted that no, they would prefer to die at home. And this idea of the hospice as a house and as a home is also something that we saw again and again. And maybe that's something that could do with a slightly deeper look. Oh, I skipped a slide here. So what then is a hospice supposed to be? And what inspiration should it draw on? And how should we think about and define its function? And here I'm talking largely about a freestanding independent organization. I know that these days a lot of hospice care takes place in people's homes. There are often palliative care units which are attached to acute hospitals as well. Here we're talking about the more independent uh, hospice buildings. Well, those buildings, those hospices, they have a few roles to play. One of those is to provide shelter from the elements, so four walls and a roof. They need to be a place for care. And they also have a medita meditative or ritual element. So that's associated with preparing oneself for death. And ritual is something that, as I said, modern architecture and secular society have really struggled with. So the hospice was thought of as a house by Cecily Saunders, who set up the first hospice in, in South London in 1967. Home is associated with a sense of ease and a sense of comfort. And this, for the designers of hospices, this raised questions of how you could create a feeling of home in what was, in fact, still an institution. Hotels were one source of inspiration, and they do share some historical links with hospices. So the word hotel, hospital, hospice, hospitality, it all comes from the same root. They also have similar attitudes to the combination of public and private functions that 
there's a private areas for people who are residing there, but then also public areas where they can come together and where visitors from outside may come to join them. The difference is between a hotel and a hospice perhaps comes when it, you think about standards of hygiene and standards of care that are necessary in a hospice. A hospital is also a very obvious reference for a hospice, particularly because of the healthcare aspect. What is often seen as a, big, as a big negative in hospital care, which is that sort of institutional look and feel, can also actually be a positive because it has the ability to inspire a level of confidence in, and in the professionalism of the care. But hospices create a counterpoint to a hospital in a number of ways. So size is one. Hospices tend to be much smaller. It means you don't have the corridor problem. It also means that... Um, it's much easier to know everybody within a hospice in a way that just wouldn't be possible in a large general hospital, for example. The other thing is that hospices, because of the sorts of treatment that they provide, they don't have to deal with the issues of large pieces of machinery, huge amounts of plant and of ducts and cables that hospitals have to contend with. That means that hospices are actually much freer to experiment and to imagine what buildings for healthcare might be. For me, though, one of the most interesting examples in healthcare architecture at the moment is the Maggie Centres. Now, there are some differences with hospices in the sense that Maggie Centres only provide out, outpatient support and that they typically only deal with people who are suffering from cancer. But still, the, the brief is very instructive. And in case some of you don't know, this was... Um, Maggie Centres were actually founded by an, an architect, a landscape architect called Charles Jenks. And he, because of his profession, he, he brought a huge ambition for the architecture of these centres. So the brief is interesting. It's, um, it emphasises that the Maggie Centre is not a home. It talks about how coziness and domesticity aren't enough to meet the varying demands that patients have at what is a very demanding time of their lives. And so they ask that the architecture rise to meet the occasion, that it has, has to encompass a requirement for larger meaning at somebody's end of life. So one thing that is common to the Maggie centres, and there's a number of them around the country, is that they, they tend to be centred around a kitchen table, and patients are encouraged to to hang out there, to chat, to bring their visitors there, to make their own cups of tea. And so it, the place has echoes of home, but more than the sort of coziness and domesticity of that, this is a place that patients can take ownership of. So in 2006, the Lighthouse Architecture Centre, which is based in Glasgow, carried out a study of patients at one of the Maggie centres in Dundee, which was designed by Frank Gehry. And they found something pretty amazing, which was that the longer that the patients had spent in that centre, the more positively they viewed their quality of life. And what they found was most important in that was that their ability to make small changes in their environment, to open windows, to move furniture, to get up and go and make themselves a cup of tea, were the things that had had a disproportionate impact on their psychological well-being. This was the control that was often removed from them when they were in an institution and which was returned to them in the Maggie Centre and also arguably at home. Now, there's a number of factors that have been shown to greatly improve patient experience in healthcare environments. And these go back to studies of architecture and healthcare buildings from the 80s, that giving patients a sense of agency to give them good daylighting to give them a view of greenery out of the windows have all been shown to greatly increase well-being in these environments. And that's as measured in their need for pain relief, their perception of the pain that they feel, their perception of food quality. They think that food is much better when they have daylight and can control their environment and can open the windows. And they tend to think that the staff are nicer and that the quality of care that they're receiving is higher. Now, this concept, the the fact that architecture can have this impact is still not fully accepted within medicine. But I see more openings for this in palliative care, 
where hospices, for example, are often built around gardens and where this ritual element is more important, where there's often the aspiration for a sense of home and to provide quality of life at the end of care, at the end of, provide quality of life at, as a priority at the end of life. What's greatly ironic to me is that um, this designing for wellness in, in hospice care is that in designing for good death and yeah, the irony for me is that in designing for a good death and designing for dying, that you're actually designing for wellness and that this is something that would actually benefit everyone in a healthcare environment. Whether it's a patient who is terminally ill who goes on to die, whether it's a patient in a slightly different context who does go on to make a full recovery. For visitors, it would be beneficial and also for the staff who are working in these buildings. And I suspect that this is something that other healthcare providers could do well to learn from the hospice movement. So the relative youth of the idea, as well as the fact that hospices don't have quite the same onerous demands that are placed on other healthcare buildings, means that hospices have a real opportunity to think what healthcare, to rethink what healthcare means and what the architecture of healthcare might be. We're currently still quite tied to the expectations for hospices which have been created by the idea of hospital and by the idea of home. It may mean returning to first principles to understand what shelter and care and ritual can mean in a hospice environment, and from there to move beyond the existing paradigms of home and of hospital to discover what a hospice actually needs to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, your talk linked really well with what we heard this morning on the history of um, palliative care and hospice care. Um, I wonder if we have any questions from the audience. We've got a few minutes. Um, I'm wondering that we, we can do this within hospice, and often our hospice buildings are beautiful. How do we transfer this to create good environments for dying within hospitals and communities? Um, yeah, I mean, so one of, one of the things that has been most difficult about trying to continue this research has been, um, you know, the, the realization, um, and the, I have some friends who work in the Helix Centre in London, which is actually, um, it's a design centre which is based within a hospital and they focus very heavily on, on healthcare and particularly a friend who works on uh, palliative care and death. And he's sort of, we've, we've talked a lot about this. It's actually, it, it's very easy to sort of think of solutions. It's easy, even relatively easy to think of quite workable solutions what's very difficult is then to get them implemented because, um, yeah, th there's a much larger health system that you then need to fit back within. I think some of it, some of the answer to that is probably knowledge sharing. Um, yeah. So it's a really difficult question. It's, it's a, really a very difficult question. I yeah. think the thing that struck me, thank you for your talk, was that, that it's the little things. So if we can create the opportunity to make a cup of tea, yeah. then maybe those are the things. That, so it might seem too out of reach to redesign a, a building, but yeah, I mean, I think there's what's often funny in these en environments is that there are a lot of small things that could be done. So there's studies where people, when people were given a pot plant to look after that that, that increased their well-being massively. Um, there's there's quite a lot of things that um, that are built into the building, and they were built in sort of like at the point that it was constructed, sort of 25 years ago, which is that perhaps the windows don't open, for example. Um, and we I think there's a huge amount of of the hospital real estate in this country, which was built in sort of the mid 90s and is 
is now about 25 years old and it's perhaps coming up for renewal. And so as those buildings are renewed, I think that there's an opportunity to, to sort of retrofit and to rethink and to sort of make sure that make sure that windows open, try and introduce better daylighting, things like that. Yeah. Um, I was really interested, Alison, in what you said about cosiness. If we think about many people here have visited many hospices, some are at the very cosy end and some are very contemporary now and possibly emulating the Maggie Centre. And I think that's very interesting that we're not trying to... You, Sorry, there's better quality of life studies from the hospices or the healthcare settings that aren't just trying to bring home into the institution and that it's more complex than that. Yeah, I mean, I would... I would also sort of add to that that an idea of an idea of home and an idea of coziness perhaps doesn't need to get too wrapped up in a particular aesthetic either. You know, I think in many ways it doesn't matter so much whether you have, you know, a more chintz-filled uh, area or whether you, it looks like all of your furniture came from Ikea and is very sort of stripped down. That's much less of, a, of an issue than... The agency. The, yeah, the agency and the sort of bigger ideas that, that it represents. Hi, Alison. It's Sarah Russell from Hospice UK. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Um, could I just ask you, if any of us in this room were building a hospice right now, what advice would you give us? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I, think, I think I would advise people to go and have a look at a very wide range of healthcare buildings to just see what's out there. Because I think that that's going to be a big thing in sort of helping to move beyond preconceptions of, of what a hospice needs to be like, what a hospice sort of is like, um, whether it needs to be, yeah, like a home or like a hospital. I think sort of having, um, having a good knowledge of a range of options is probably the most helpful thing in helping to make informed choices about what a particular building needs to be like. And I do recommend everybody to go and visit the Maggie Centre if they're thinking about uh, rejuvenating daycare. It is quite remarkable. And I had no idea that there's actually been some quality of life studies on giving people agency within an institution. So I'm really interested in that. And just remembering that we used to have signs on the wall in the hospice I worked which said, don't move the chairs. So. <laughs> wow. So. I mean, th this... I mean, there's, there's been a lot of um, studies not, which are not from a healthcare perspective, but which are perhaps in, a, in an office perspective, which is, you know, people are more productive and happier when they're sitting close to a window. People are happier and more productive when they can control their environment, when they can open that window. And it would I kind of, it would be surprising if that didn't carry across to a healthcare setting. We've probably got time for one more question. I, th I think we've got two. A little okay, bit there two. That's, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, we have often observed um, at the hospice where I work, when you bring the patients in through the door when you're transferring them from a hospital environment and they come in through the hospice, we get them into their room, there's an almost immediate improvement in their condition. Mm -hmm. And that's even before they've started to experience the care. And I'm sure that's a reflection of everything you've been saying today. I think it's very, very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's one more question there. So I'm Debbie Raven from Thames Hospice. Thank you. That was, that was really interesting. Um, one of the key things that I've taken away today, which is, I think, so important, is the importance of control. Mm. And when we think about the patients that we have, certainly in our inpatient units, we don't tend to associate that with control of their environment, maybe control of their symptoms or psychological control, absolutely. Um, but it's obviously so important that we give that control to their relatives, loved ones who are visiting, um, and that can help them in that more holistic sense. 
Last question at the front here, I think. Thank you. Yeah, you talked a lot about um, light and the benefit of light, um, but um, the aspect that perhaps you haven't mentioned, it's not exactly architecture, but it's about colour. Mm. And I remember when I worked at a hospice in London and my stepmother came because my father was actually a um, day patient there. And she, she's an artist and she said, Sophie, this is, this is um, such a drab, depressing environment. There's no colour anywhere. There's no colour. It's awful. And I, hadn't I said, well, there's a few paintings on the walls. And she went, no, no, that's not it. That's not it. It's just, you know, there's no colour. There's no life. And it really changed the way I, I saw it. Mm. Um, and uh, just, I suppose, when you're not able to necessarily redesign a building, maybe just finding different ways of bringing colour and life into the buildings that you have. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly like a, a coat of paint is a lot cheaper than replacing a facade, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I guess also sort of allowing patients to bring their own, their own things from home too, to sort of help decorate the home, to help decorate their room and, and their area. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's like giving people a pot plant. It's like... And that pale green, yeah. <laughs> That's called NHS green, I think. I think on um, that note, I also forgot to say that Alison is actually a TED fellow. And if you want to look at more of her work, she's on the internet. She's done two TED talks, I think. And I recommend you to read them. So could we thank Alison again? Thank you.